Thank you, uh, Dr. Balachandran. Uh, my presentation is in three parts. Uh, first, I will talk about the norms that have come to govern the international territorial order since the end of the Second World War. Uh, next, I will highlight China's emergent challenge to these norms and to the territorial status quo in Asia. And finally, I will focus on the India-Japan strategic partnership and how I see a certain the process of convergence of their policies on Asian territorial issues have begun to emerge now. Uh, to begin with, states, of course, are territorial entities, and consequently, territory has been the principal cause of interstate conflict. 78% of all wars between the years 1648, that's when the uh, origins of the modern interstate system began, until the end of the Second World War. That is, 78% of wars between 1648 and 1945 were fully or partly caused by contests over territory. Now, this proportion declined only slightly to 69% in the post-Second World War period between 1945 and 2000. There is, however, a significant difference between the wars waged over territory in the pre and post-1945 eras. And that difference pertains to the number of wars that actually resulted in either outright territorial conquest or redistribution of territory for balance of power or other purposes. Now, if you take each 50-year period between 1651 and 1950, there's a very high percentage of wars ranging from 67% to 89% resulted in conquest or territorial redistribution. In contrast, between 1951 and the year 2000, only 27% of wars actually resulted in any territorial redistribution. Now, one of the more significant explanations for this remarkable decline in instances of territorial redistribution through war is the international norm of territorial integrity, which was first formally incorporated in the Covenant of the League of Nations, then subsequently reiterated in the Kellogg-Bryan Pact of 1928, and subsequently enshrined in the UN Charter. Now, simply put, the territorial integrity norm proscribes states from using military force to conquer territory or otherwise alter interstate boundaries. Now, this norm in the post-Cold War era was further reinforced in the uh, early 90s when Iraq's annexation of Kuwait was reversed by an international coalition led by the United States. And closer home in South Asia, in March 2000, President Bill Clinton made an indirect reference to this norm during his television address to the Pakistani people when he bluntly said, this era does not reward people who struggle in vain to redraw borders with blood. The other principle that has contributed to the preservation of the territorial status quo in the post-World War II era is the widespread acceptance of the international legal principle called uti posseditis. Now, translated into as you possess, this principle prescribes pre-existing administrative borders as the boundaries of newly emerging states, as well as for settling interstate territorial or border disputes. Now, it is on the basis of this principle that the international borders of the post-Soviet republics were arrived at in the 1990s. And earlier, the international boundaries of Asian and African states, which achieved independence from colonial rule by exercising the right to self-determination. Now, the, another norm that has been introduced in the post-Cold War era is the issue of human rights to serve as a justification for secession and self-determination. But the fact remains that this norm is highly contested and its application has been very limited during the last 20, 25 years. Now, the short point of, of all this is that in, by delegitimizing war as a means of territorial conquest or otherwise altering interstate borders, the territorial order created at the end of the Second World War and the norms underpinning that order have provided a, highly, a very high, a relatively high degree of stability to the international system. But will this order and the stability that it has engendered endure in Asia in the coming years? And here I come to the second part of my presentation. The principal and most significant challenge to the Asian territorial order today comes from China. 
Now, it is true that China has settled 17 out of its 23 territorial disputes, that too on the basis of substantial compromises in most cases. But it is also true that China has not only not adopted a flexible approach to the remaining disputes, but has also upped the ante on these issues during the last several years. Now, in the case of India, China has abandoned the original proposal of a territorial swap. It has resiled from the understanding that was reached in 2005 on the political parameters that should guide the resolution of the boundary dispute and has expanded its claim to the whole of Arunachal Pradesh. In the case of the South China Sea, China has begun to assert sovereign rights over practically the whole of those waters and is establishing facts on the ground by reclamation and militarization of islets and islands. In effect, in the South China Sea, China's aspiration seems to be to transform these waters, these international waters, into a Chinese lake and Chinese territorial waters. And in the East China Sea, China contests Japan's control over the Senkakus, has termed this particular dispute as a core issue on which it will not compromise, and it has reportedly begun to refer to the air defense identification zone over parts of the sea as Chinese airspace. And last but not the least, China has expressed its determination to use force and militarily conquer and absorb Taiwan, despite the strong sentiment among a majority of Taiwanese to retain a separate status. Now, together, these Chinese <coughs> territorial claims and creeping efforts to encroach and establish facts on the ground constitute an emergent challenge to the territorial status quo in Asia and to the norms that underpin the current international order. China's rising power and these hegemonic ambitions have driven India and Japan to forge a strategic partnership during the last 10 years or so. Now, this emerging partnership is marked by annual summit meetings, a whole array of diplomatic and defense exchanges, expanding cooperation between the navies, regular exercises, etc. The other significant aspects, the multilateral um, aspects of this partnership include trilateral dialogues with Australia and with the United States, Japan's inclusion as a permanent member in the annual Malabar exercises, and the revived quad quadrilateral dialogue among these four countries. Now, the purpose, the, what Japan and India aspire to achieve through this strategic partnership was clearly spelt out in the joint statement that has been issued uh, for the last several years. And here, I would reference the statement issued in September 2017 when Prime Minister Abe visited India. Now, the purpose of this strategic partnership, according to this statement, is a free, open, and prosperous Indo-Pacific where all countries enjoy freedom of navigation and overflight. Now, for this purpose, Abe and Modi have also pledged to reinforce their efforts to align Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy with India's ACTIS policy, including through enhanced maritime security cooperation, connectivity, and so on. And in addition, they've also agreed to enhance defense and security cooperation and dialogues, including the Malabar and other joint exercises, as well as strengthen trilateral cooperation with the United States, Australia, and other countries. Now, these incremental steps in establishing and furthering the strategic partnership are being complemented by a glacial process of policy convergence on the, on the various territorial issues in Asia that I highlighted earlier. The one issue on which there has been official expressions of a degree of convergence is with respect to China's extraordinary territorial claims to the South China Sea. Now, despite that, the joint statements that were issued in 2015 and 2016 limited themselves to generalities, such as they highlighted the regions, their own interest and the regions in, uh, entire region's interest in maintaining the sea lanes of communication in the South China Sea, and they called upon all the states, all the states to avoid unilateral actions, uh, negotiate a code of conduct, and ultimately resolve the dispute by peaceful means in accordance with international law, including UNCLOS. But there is a hint of backsliding even on this issue, evident from the omission of any direct reference to the South China Sea in the September 2017 joint statement that Abe and Modi uh, issued. Of course, the Foreign Secretary on that occasion kind of 
explained it away by saying the Indo-Pacific covers South uh, China Sea. And anyway, uh, India's support for freedom of navigation is not limited to any particular maritime domain, but extends to uh, the entire world, all the seas and, and the oceans. Now, second, on the question of Taiwan, during the last 10 years or so, India's and Japan's policies have evolved independently of each other, albeit in a roughly similar direction. Now, in response to China issuing stapled visas to the residents of Jammu and Kashmir sometime in 2007 or 8, thus subtly indicating a shift in China's policy towards Kashmir, India stopped affirming its commitment to the One China policy since the year 2010. Now, the resultant ambiguity in the Indian position is captured in the following statement that was made by Minister of State uh, General V.K. Singh in the Lok Sabha in our parliament in August 2017, and I quote, Government of India's policy on Taiwan is clear and consistent. There is no change in the government of India's policy of promoting exchanges in trade, investment, tourism, culture, uh, uh, you know, education and people-to-people -people areas. There is no whisper, no mention of uh, one China policy. Now, for its part, Japan, which committed itself to a one China policy only in the 1970s, has not only stepped up contacts with Taiwan since the 2000s, but it has, together with the United States in the mid-90s, identified a peaceful resolution to the Taiwan issue as a common strategic objective. Now, keeping with this trend, more recently, Japan has enacted laws to broaden the areas and expand the scope of all the overseas activities of its uh, armed forces, the self-defense forces. And while the 2015 guidelines for Japan-US defense cooperation has not prescribed any preset geographical limit as the ambit in which this cooperation will operate. Now, India and Japan also appear to be beginning to gradually inch forward on extending support to each other on their respective territorial disputes with China. Now, during the Doklam crisis uh, earlier this year, Japan's ambassador to India expressed his un country's understanding of the reasons for India's involvement in this particular dispute between Bhutan and China, namely India's treaty commitments. Now, India, for its part, has been voicing similar indirect support for Japan's position in the East China Sea in the joint statements that have been issued in the last three years by highlighting the importance of freedom of overflight in the wake of China's declaration of the air defense uh, identification zone. Now, to, to conclude, in both India and China, this trajectory of rather incremental progress in building up the strategic partnership is seen as optimal and even prudent, given the imperative of not provoking China, which is moreover an important economic partner for both countries. But it must also be recognized here that a mix of such conciliation and tentative diplomatic and military balancing may actually prove ineffective against an adversary that aims to overthrow the territorial status quo and the international order uh, underpinned by the territorial status quo. An apt example here is Britain's failure to constrain Germany in the run-up to the First World War when it pursued exactly such a policy of part balancing and part conciliation. And Britain attempted this kind of a straddle precisely because deep economic ties with Germany had generated domestic pressures and constraints against a pure, hard balancing policy. Now, the mixed signals that subsequently emanated from London led Berlin to optimistically conclude that Britain may stay out of a war on the continent if Germany were to attain a swift victory. Now, in the light of this example, it may actually prove more prudent for India and Japan to send unambiguous messages to China with regard to its territorial and hegemonic ambitions in Asia. With that, I stop. Thank you very much.